All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Um, today, we're going to be for this portion of the uh, of the program. We're going to be talking about diabetes in the general provider. Um, I want to let everyone, everyone know I have no financial disclosures. Um, so our learning objectives to review the clinical presentation of diabetes, to discuss means of distinguishing between type one diabetes and type two diabetes, which are the types of diabetes that we're primarily gonna be focusing on for the purposes of this talk, to review methods of diagnosing diabetes and to discuss principles of management, um, including medication management, um, but also addressing some of the psychosocial barriers that our patients frequently encounter. So just a little bit of background. I know this is a topic that Dr. Wintergrist has covered in some detail in his talk, but um, according to uh, the CDC's most recent data, um, the incidence and prevalence of diabetes in children has been increasing quite steadily over the past 20 years. And this is true for both type one and type two diabetes. Um, in 2009, type one diabetes affected about one in every 518 youth less than 20 years old. Um, with an incidence of about 22 per 100,000 individuals per year. Um, in this, the Search for Diabetes study, which has been referenced several times today, um, estimates that each year approximately 18,000 new cases of type 1 diabetes occur in youth aged less than 20 years. There are about 5,000 new cases per year of type 2 diabetes. And interestingly, the prevalence increases with age, um, tripling from age 10 to 14 years. And to that, uh, to the prevalence at age 15 to 18 years. Um, the, between 2002 and 2015, the incidence of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes increased in almost all age, sex, and race or ethnicity groups. So this is um, something that we're seeing across um, a spectrum uh, of patients from various backgrounds. Even as the incidence and prevalence of diabetes is increasing, um, their access to care, specifically to subspecialty care from pediatric endocrinologists, um, can sometimes be limited for a number of our patients. So a 2015 paper um, assessed the population-based geographic access to endocrinologists in the United States in 2012. Um, and what they found was actually quite interesting. Um, so 94% of urban, 66% of rural, and 58% of urban cluster children have access to at least one pediatric endocrinologist within 50 miles. But within a 20 mile radius, that access decreases significantly to only about 80% of urban children, 20% of rural children, and 10% of children who are living in urban clusters. Um, in Kentucky specifically, um, about 34 to 50% of children aged 0 to 17 years had access to at least one pediatric endocrinologist within a 20 mile radius. We are fortunate, there are actually some states um, in, in the US where there is actually no pediatric endocrinologists at all. Um, but for sure, um, there is a shortage of, of specialists, um, specifically endocrinologists, um, to manage a problem that has, or a disease process has been, that has been becoming more prevalent over time. And so in many instances, primary care doctors play an invaluable role in the diagnosis of diabetes and in providing management support to families with children who are affected by diabetes. And so I think it's really important that um, when we're focusing on the education specifically of our pediatric trainees um, in regards to the diagnosis and basic management of diabetes, um, that we, you know, it's of paramount importance that we, we educate them well on recognizing the signs and symptoms of diabetes um, and making sort of basic diagnostic, um, taking care of ba basic diagnostic tests and possibly providing some amount of care as well. Um, and certainly good communication between primary care providers and subspecialty endocrine providers is also of paramount importance in helping our patients achieve good glycemic control and um, the best long-term outcomes that we possibly, that they possibly can. So as far as the clinical presentation of diabetes, um, the hallmark clinical symptoms of diabetes include, of course, polyuria and polydipsia. Nocturia is seen very often. Um, fatigue is a common complaint amongst children who present with diabetes. Um, certainly, especially if, if 
the hyperglycemia has been longstanding. Uh, weight loss occurs at presentation. Um, glycosuria is often present at the time of diagnosis. And of course, ketonuria may also be noted um, at presentation. About one third of patients who uh, with type 1 diabetes will present in DKA. Um, and symptoms of DKA include abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, deep breathing, which we of course uh, in the medical field refer to who small respirations. And certainly it can progress to the point of altered mentation um, and um, quick rec recognition of the signs and, and symptoms of DKA is of course very important um, because this can be a life-threatening complication of, of diabetes. Interestingly, the glucose and the A1C often rise well before the clinical onset of diabetes symptoms. And so astute clinicians might be able to actually make a diagnosis before a child you know, presents in DKA. And if we can, we can spare them um, that, that complication, of course, that would be our, our ultimate goal. <clears throat> So how do we make a diagnosis of diabetes if we have a clinical suspicion uh, that a patient has diabetes or as Dr. Folsom and Dr. Watson touched on, if you have a patient who's at risk for diabetes and you would like to screen them, what is the best way to do that? In the absence of unequivocal hyperglycemia, um, then you need a diagnosis requires two abnormal lab tests. Um, and this table here kind of demonstrates the various tests that we are able to perform in order to screen um, or make a diagnosis of diabetes. So a fasting plasma glucose, again, not a point of care glucose, but a fasting plasma glucose greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter. Um, and of course, fasting is defined, defined as no caloric intake for at least eight hours, which sometimes you know, we have to specify to families. Um, don't have your morning Starbucks before you come in for your test. Um, a two hour post, uh, post prandial glucose of 200 milligrams per deciliter um, during an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, the test should be performed as per the guidelines that are set forth by the WHO using a glucose load um, of 1.75 grams per kilo to a max of 75 grams of glucose dissolved, dissolved in water, um, or a hemoglobin A1C result of greater than or equal to 6.5%. Um, as Dr. Watson touched on, sometimes hemoglobin A1C assays um, can be inaccurate, especially early in the course of um, evolving diabetes. So tests should be performed in a laboratory setting if at all possible um, and use a method that is certified and standardized appropriately. Um, if a patient has classic symptoms of hyperglycemia such as polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, um, or of course if they're in hyperglycemic crisis, then a random plasma glucose um, of greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter um, in addition to those symptoms is adequate to make a diagnosis of diabetes. So one of, uh, I think the, the biggest um, challenges that we all face today as clinicians is differentiating between type one and type two diabetes. I do wanna take a minute just to sort of talk about classically what we would expect to see. Um, and this touches a little bit on pathophysiology as well as um, clinical features that, that we might see in type one versus type two diabetes. So as we all know, um, type one diabetes um, is, occurs due to cellular mediated autoimmune destruction of beta cells. There are multiple genetic predispositions to autoimmune beta cell destruction. We also know that there is some sort of, of environmental factor that triggers autoimmune destruction of the beta cells. Um, but that trigger is sort of poorly understood and we haven't characterized it very well yet. Um, certainly could be uh, a viral, and certainly something in um, the environment as far as our nutrition, something that's still an active area of research. Diabetes typically is gonna become clinically apparent when about 90% of the beta cell mass is destroyed um, and autoimmune destruction of beta cells probably begins months to maybe even years before there's actual onset of symptoms. Um, at the time of diagnosis in type 1 diabetes, there's absolute insulin deficiency. Um, some of the antibodies that we obtain to assess for um, type 1 diabetes include islet cell autoantibodies, GAD65, insulin, IA2 antibodies, 
And more recently, the zinc transporter eight autoantibodies have also um, become clinically very relevant and useful. The rate of beta cell destruction does vary. It tends to be more rapid in children and adolescents as compared to adults. Um, C-peptide and insulin levels at the time of diagnosis before insulin um, therapy has been initiated um, can certainly be very, can have a lot of clinical utility. In type 1 diabetes, we would expect the C-peptide and insulin levels to be low, and sometimes they're even undetectable at the time of diagnosis. Um, I know Dr. Wasted and Dr. Folsom did an excellent job of sort of reviewing the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. In general, in type 2 diabetes, um, as opposed to having that um, absolute insulin deficiency, we see relative insulin deficiency, and oftentimes peripheral insulin resistance is seen as well. Risk factors for type 2 diabetes include adiposity, family history of diabetes, female sex, um, and low socioeconomic status. Interestingly, we do see that in youth with type 2 diabetes, as compared to their adult counterparts, there is much more rapid beta cell destruction, um, and they oftentimes are at risk for accelerated development of long-term microvascular and even macrovascular complications of diabetes. Given the current obesity epidemic, distinguishing between type 1 and type 2 diabetes in children can be quite difficult. Overweight and obesity are common in children with type 1 diabetes, and diabetes-associated autoantibodies and ketosis may be present in pediatric patients with features of type 2 diabetes, such as obesity and acanthosis microcans. Um, we also know that DKA at onset of type 2 diabetes occurs more commonly in children than it does in adults with type 2 diabetes. So about 6% of youth well, actually, aged 10 to 19 years with type 2 diabetes um, uh, will present in DKA. Whoops, sorry. Um, Although uncommon, type 2 diabetes has been observed in prepubertal children under the age of 10 years, and it should be part of the differential in children with suggestive symptoms. If you have a child who um, phenotypically appears to be uh, more likely having type 2 diabetes, so they have the acanthosis, they have uh, peripheral si signs of peripheral insulin resistance, um, it's still important to check autoantibodies, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide, because we know that even in children with insulin resistance, the presence of islet cell autoantibodies is associated with a faster progression to insulin deficiency um, and then the, the need for insulin therapy. So given the higher incidence of type 1 diabetes in children um, and increased difficulty in distinguishing between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, all children with overweight and obesity in whom a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus is being considered, and certainly if a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus has been made, um, all of these children should have pancreatic antibodies obtained to rule out type 1 diabetes because the implications as far as treatment are, are huge, um, and including the decision of whether insulin therapy needs to be started or whether oral antihyperglycine agents um, can, be, can be initiated. So how do we really make a decision about the initial management of, di uh, of diabetes, especially in patients um, who have features of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes? I think the key to remember is that the initial management of diabetes, no matter what you know, the underlying diagnosis is, type 1 or type 2, um, the initial management should really be targeted towards management of hyperglycemia as well as any metabolic derangements that are present, such as ketonuria or ketosis. So um, even a in a patient who has clinical features suggestive of type 2 diabetes, in the setting of market hyperglycemia, which you know, could be defined as a blood sugar of greater than 250 milligrams per deciliter, or an A1C of greater than 8.5%, with or without ketosis, insulin therapy should be initiated. Um, I really like this algorithm, which comes from the ADA standards of diabetes care, which really kind of helps break down um, the medical decision-making in these complex uh, clinical scenarios. If you have a child who has an A1C of less than 8.5%, no acidosis or ketosis, 
then completely reasonable to start them on metformin monotherapy while pancreatic anti uh, autoantibody results are pending. Of course, if the antibodies return and are positive, then you should continue um, insulin therapy if it's been started or initiate multiple daily insulin um, or pump therapy, um, assuming a diagnosis of type one diabetes and metformin can actually be discontinued at that point in time. If you have a child who has an A1C of greater than 8.5% without acidosis or ketosis, certainly start them on metformin therapy. Um, but you should also, these children should also be started on at least basal insulin therapy, typically at about 0.5 minutes per kilo per day. Um, and again, once the autoantibody results um, return, if they're positive, they should be transitioned to full MDI therapy. If they're negative, um, they should continue on metformin, titrating that dose up to about 2,000 milligrams per day as they're able, able to tolerate. And then, you know, monitoring their blood sugars closely, assessing whether they're meeting their A1C and glycemic targets, and weaning insulin as tolerated as glycemic control improves um, would, be, would be sort of the path moving forward. Of course, any child who has acidosis is in DKA or um, uh, HHS, um, that they should be sent, of course, to an ICU setting and their DKA and um, HHS should be managed um, as appropriate. So I think the real key here is that if you have a child um, and a diagnosis of diabetes has been made, even if a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is suspected, obtaining pancreatic autoantibodies is really paramount to making the appropriate management decisions. Um, and um, if that A1C, initial A1C is greater than or equal to 8.5%, even if there's no acidosis or ketosis noted on the um, initial evaluation completed in the PCP's office, these children really need to be started on insulin therapy, even if it's just basal insulin therapy as opposed to MDI therapy. And so these are the kids that you want to make sure that you're reaching out to our office. We're always happy to talk to, to anybody in the community, providers, um, families, um, and you know we can help make a decision about whether the child needs to be referred to the ER or if we're able to bring them into our office for sort of an urgent outpatient visit to start them on appropriate therapy with insulin and any oral antihyperglycemic agents that they may need. Um, of course, um, the, the treatment of type one diabetes should be focused on um, treating the person as a whole. And so management is really um, outside of medication management. Um, we really try to approach children with diabetes in sort of a multidisciplinary fashion uh, with the assistance of our diabetes educators, the licensed clinical social workers. Um, it, it's really a team-based approach. We know that youth with type 1 and type 2 diabetes often experience a disproportionate amount of psychosocial stressors. Um, this is due to their chronic underlying illness, financial burden of disease, they're at increased risk of disordered eating, um, and so regular assessment of psychosocial stress, diabetes burnout, and social determinants of health is really imperative in ensuring um, that these children have the best possible long-term outcomes. Early detection of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and learning disabilities can facilitate effective treatment options, help minimize adverse effects on diabetes management and, um, and disease outcomes. And so again, sort of that multidisciplinary approach and having really good communication between the endocrine um, and diabetes office and primary care physicians who often um, are much more in tune with local community um, services that are available to our families who live in some of the more, like I said, rural or um, uh, distant parts of, of the state. I think that having that communication is really important and just making sure that we're doing everything we can to optimize our, our patient's care. And so without further ado, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Eric now, and he's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the psychosocial stressors that um, our, our patients experience, specifically bullying. All right, thank you everyone. Excuse us as we switch out. Um, Again, my name is Eric, diabetes educator here at the Wendy Novak Center. Um, 
And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about the psychosocial aspect of diabetes and particularly um, about bullying, uh, because um, this is unfortunately similar to the racial disparities topic in that um, it, is a, it does have a real impact on um, diabetes control and management and uh, uh, health outcomes. So diabetes, it's really a very multifactorial kind of um, condition. It's very physical. There's the poking, the injecting, the wearing, the technology. Um, it's very mental. There's carb counting involved, constantly thinking about um, what's my blood sugar. So a lot going on mentally. And it's also extremely emotional. Um, I believe that we have a relationship with diabetes and that relationship really dictates how we manage it. If we have a good relationship, we'll be more inclined to manage our diabetes and have better health outcomes. If we dislike diabetes or hate diabetes even, we don't want to take care of something that we hate, which will lead to non-adherence, burnout, and eventually negative health outcomes. So I think all of these three are just as important and the emotional aspect really can dictate the other two. So bullying, it is something that can often go under the radar, but can have a very real effect on diabetes outcomes. Um, there have been a couple studies that have looked at this, and while there's a lot of confounding factors that could skew this data, um, it is a very real thing as shown in the literature. So one uh, meta-analysis looked at the incidence and prevalence of bullying in children with type 1 diabetes um, compared to kids without diabetes, and they found that it was higher in the children with type 1 diabetes than in comparison to kids without diabetes. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that that we'll touch on here in a minute, but they also found a correlation between bullying, depressive symptoms, um, and non-adherence. So obviously with bullying, they're going to it'll degrade that relationship that they have with their diabetes, which makes them not want to manage it. Um, and that in turn leads to higher A1Cs. So we, the, the literature looked at, um, these studies looked at kids between eight to 17. And from just anecdotal experience, I would say that this affects mostly like middle to high schoolers because that's the time that you know, values such as similarity to your peers is really, really important. And um, middle schoolers, you know, to be frank, can just be jerks. <laughs> but we've seen this, or I've seen this even as young as kids that are six years old, not wanting the people to know about diabetes. Maybe they have a fear of being bullied. So it is a real thing in even our younger population, unfortunately. So there are a few reasons for bullying that we can kind of pick out. So first off, I think there's a stigmatization around diabetes that comes from a lack of education. So if, if you have a bully that doesn't know anyone with diabetes, or maybe their only reference to diabetes is their grandma, um, <laughs> that person is going to look very different than the classmate that they're bullying. So they have no personal connection to diabetes to educate them on what it is. And so if they had um, you know, an older sibling, with type one diabetes, that would probably have a very, give them a very different perspective and they would approach that classmate very differently. Um, so I think a lack of education can lead to bullying. And as the late great Yoda once said, ignorance leads to fear and fear leads to anger. So I think if we can educate these kids that can maybe prevent or um, diminish a lot of the bullying that we see. So just differences to other children can lead to bullying. So like we said, that middle to high school age, assimilation to your peers is really important. That's a really high value, but diabetes just inherently makes that, that person different in a lot of ways. Routine, they have to get under the nurse before lunch every single day. Um, they have to eat different food potentially. You know, they're carrying glucotabs around. Um, they might be using the bathroom more than their other peers. So things that just inherently make them stick out. Um, and then they're also using external things like pumps and CGM technology that sticks off of their body and kind of just makes them a, a target for these kids that are bullying. So it's, it's not that it, it just makes them a little bit more of a victim and an easier target for these kids that are bullying. And as an aside, I think if someone is a bully, it doesn't really matter why they're bullying. This diabetes just 
allows it to be easier because they're a little bit more of a target. So how can this affect diabetes management? So like we talked about, this degrades their relationship to diabetes. So if someone is making fun of them because of their diabetes, they are going to dislike this condition that they have that they can't get rid of. And again, they're not going to want to manage something or take care of something that they hate. So that leads to oftentimes a lot of feelings of shame and isolation, which again, just further degrades that relationship and they don't want to manage it, higher A1Cs, worse health outcomes. Um, because they don't want to be different, that will oftentimes lead to them intentionally not taking care of themselves and doing what they need to do. So a lot of times with our teenagers, and this mostly is with our teenagers, they will not go down to the nurse's office at school. And because they have that freedom, you know, they're older, nobody's making them, they don't have to go if they don't want to. Now we can write school orders that say they have to, but the nurses might not be chasing them around the school. Um, so they're going to deviate from the uh, adherence that they need to while they're at school. Um, they might also not want diabetes technology to have that external thing sticking off of them that makes them a target. So I have seen a lot of patients that when um, we discuss technology and offer technology as a way to make their management easier and better, um, a lot of times they deny it because they don't want other people to, to see the pump or the, the CGM sticking off their body because they know it will make them a target. So um, unfortunately, bullying can lead to them not using this technology that will make things better. So if bullying is something that um, as a general provider is discussed while you're seeing your patients, or even if it's something that um, comes up, or it, just know that this could be one of the reasons that their A1Cs have been running higher. So first off, we wanna affirm their feelings. You know, they, so they know that they're heard and they're understood. We're not sweeping their concern away and under the rug. So um, things like saying, I understand this is hard, this is difficult, let them know that you hear them and you feel them. And then we wanna normalize being different, again, so that they don't feel isolated and they don't feel different from everyone else, but to understand that we are all together in our differences. So everyone has something that makes them unique that a lot of times we can see or we cannot see, but everybody has something that's, that makes them different. So that way they feel normal within their differences. And then facilitate a conversation that they can have with their peers. So if, if this particular student is bold enough to reach out and discuss with the person that's bullying with them, they can talk about things like, I need this medication, I have to have this to live, because that bully might not understand why they're going to the nurse's office every day or why they go to the bathroom, you know, five times more than everyone else in their class. So education can be that missing piece to end that bullying and bridge that gap between the bully and the student. And sometimes just confronting the bully might be enough. But I understand that a lot of people that are bullied will not confront that bully. So then having that discussion with the parents to discuss with the school counselor or the teacher to see what they can do to fix the problem, um, discuss with that student that's bullying, and maybe come up with a plan that this, if this student doesn't want to manage diabetes at school, that they could choose a different place to go away from the class or somewhere that they could slip out that makes it not as noticeable. Um, so facilitating that conversation with the, parents, with the parents to then go and talk to the teachers or a counselor. So, and then you don't have to have all of the answers. That's what uh, therapists, counselors are for. So Sheila Otten, who spoke earlier, she's the LCSW that works with most of our diabetes patients here in our office. She is awesome. And um, you could discuss Sheila as a resource with your patients and the parents um, to discuss bullying, uh, ways and techniques that, and they'll work on ways and techniques to work with this bullying, around this bullying, and around the um, emotions that are associated with it. If this particular patient lives too far or um, for whatever reason, they want to see someone different. Any, any therapy would be better than no therapy. So even Sheila is obviously specialized in diabetes and understands the management very well, but any therapist can help work through the emotions that they're feeling, and that is better than nothing. So if you know local therapists in your area and can refer to 
those therapists, that would definitely be a, a great resource to start with. But just know that Sheila is always in our office and, and she can do virtual visits if it's somebody that's far away. So unfortunately, bullying is a, a, a real thing that our patients um, experience, but hopefully through facilitating some of these conversations, giving um, the patients a little autonomy to maybe facilitate that conversation or working with the teachers and the counselors and then obviously therapy are great ways that you can step in to improve their management through the bullying or potentially ending. Thank you.